Good morning um, and welcome to the 33rd meeting of the committee in 2018. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should ensure they're turned to silent. Uh, the first item on the agenda today is consideration of the Census Amendment Scotland Bill at stage one. Uh, this is the second meeting at which we have considered the bill and the purpose of today's session is to uh, consider uh, the gathering of voluntary data on gender identity and sexual orientation uh, and we have with us a panel of data users and analysts and um, I'd like to thank you all for coming to give evidence to us today. We have Lucy Hunter Blackburn uh, from Murray Blackburn Mackenzie. We have Professor Jackie Castle, Head of the Department of Primary Care and Public Health and the Director of Research and Knowledge Exchange at the Brighton and Sussex Medical School. We have Jerry McCartney, Head of the Public Health Observatory Division uh, at NHS Scotland and Professor Susan McVeigh, Professor of Quantitative Criminology at the University of Edinburgh. Thank you all again uh, for coming. We were also due to take evidence from Ipsos Mori this morning, however, due to a lack of video conferencing facilities in their office, we have been unable uh, to do so. Um, just uh, before I ask an opening question, as, as I said, that the main purpose of the bill is to ask questions on gender identity and sexual uh, orientation on a voluntary basis. But in the course of scrutinising this, this very short bill, uh, the committee um, uh, has received evidence uh, expressing concern about the conflation of the categories of sex and uh, what is called gender identity. Uh, in the bill um, and a number of our submissions have suggested that this could be um, problematic uh, for the gathering of data as well as setting a, a, a precedent. Uh, the, the, the census team themselves uh, in their um, sex and gender topic paper say that sex is a key demographic um, and that sex data is vital uh, for um, assessing uh, various uh, demographic statistics used by local government uh, to inform resource allocation and target investment. And I note that the Women's Budget Group in a, 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 another submission have said that they rely on sex disaggregated data uh, in order to analyse the economic and social impacts on women of public policy. Now, I'm, I'm going to turn to Lucy um, Hunter-Blackburn first because I, you have submitted written uh, evidence uh, expressing those kind of concerns and I wondered if you would like to outline uh, them in particularly in the context of data gathering. Okay so I think the starting point for the, the purpose is the purpose of the census we think and you're looking at the census existing to gather data which is as useful and as reliable as possible so by reliable we mean you're getting the same kind of answer from the same kind of person you know what your answers mean. Um, so that it can be used by people who are planning and providing public services. So above all, what the census does is exists for a very specific purpose of data gathering. That's a starting point. I think that the main point I'd want to make before I say anything else is there's clearly no disagreement at all about the value of gathering more data on the population who identify as trans, and it's immensely valuable, and the census is a very good place to do that. So I think the existence and the insertion of the voluntary question and voluntary questions on that is, doesn't seem to be a matter of particular contention here, and really all the debate is about what happens with the question on sex. Um, and I think if I can make three points there, convener. I think first of all, we think it's very important that the census is continuing to capture data on sex as a protected characteristic on terms which are consistent with the Equality Act. And the Equality Act quite clearly has a, a two category definition of sex, male and female. It's not a, a more, no more categories than two. So introducing a third sex category as is proposed as what the bill is being amended to enable, um, well, the Census rather, Act is being amended to enable, that would take you out of consistency and compliance with the Equality Act and the way that that's framed. And that would definitely have issues for quality monitoring and the data's use there. The other point I'd make is that there's no evidence that service users have demanded moving away from a binary sex category in the Census. Um, they, there's no evidence at all. In fact, the, the NRS is quite clear this is not, a, not driven by um, a census users wanting an extra third category. And there's a th different sort of point which I think is also important here, which um, 
we think you need to avoid <laughs> using the Census Act um, to set a precedent on the statute book which conflates sex with gender identity because conceptually they are quite distinct things. And the Census Act doesn't feel to us the right place to be introducing new ideas about how to conceptualise sex in law. That's a, a debate that could be had, but not, not in this context. So our view is that the definition of sex in the Census Act of 1920 should remain as it is now, um, that, uh, so it's aligned with the one in the Equality Act and indeed with other legislative contexts where sex is used. So in marriage, birth, death certificates, we use a, a two-category version of sex right across the legal context. Um, and that would suggest that what you don't want to do is amend paragraph one of the schedule and where it talks about sex to introduce the, the additional words. Um, and therefore, that would mean, however, you'd also need in the, in the, in the bill, we'd need to bring up, we'd need to introduce gender identity in the same way that it introduces sexual orientation as a voluntary topic. So that, that would be my, my sort of key points. Thank you very much. And yeah, just for the, for the record, there will be uh, either a gender identity or trans question that's clear, and we'll consider the wording of that at a later date. But uh, that's in addition to the sex question. Um, do any other um, members of the panel wish to comment on this this point? Um, so I, I might comment in relation to the use of such data. I mean, obviously, there are many, many um, uses of data on sex, some of them more important than others. I think it's important to look at the wider context of data on sex. It's really important that the census is a point of reference. Um, but with the growing um, use of administrative data sets and a couple of censuses away, the census will look very different. We'll draw on NHS data, we'll draw on all sorts of data. It's really important there is consistency of the, um, of the data on sex with other data sets for the credibility of the census as such an important data resource giving information at low level on, on, on quite small populations. So it... So the various collectors of um, routine sex data will have public equality duties. It's very important that people don't start looking elsewhere because the census data is seen to be problematic. So I think there is a real issue about precedent and credibility um, for, for the census. It, um, and I would say for the purposes that... Um, the, these many data sets um, are used to draw on sex data, it is absolutely key that we do have a good representation of the definition in law um, as it currently stands. That, of course, can be discussed and moved on, but as it stands now, it is important that it is consistent with other data sets. Okay. And from health, for health purposes, what is the importance of that? Um, there are many, um, many areas of health where biological data, biological risk is very important. So those interact with, and um, in some areas very importantly interact with gender identity, but biological risk for many conditions and treatments and outcomes. We know that um, sex is a, is a big differentiator of outcomes for many conditions. It's important that that is robust in order that we meet our duties, and they are many, and they are often not well met in the um, fair in, in the in, in the fair provision of effective treatment to men and women, which may not always look the same. Can't they? Uh, it's just important for the committee to differentiate between two slightly different things. So the provision of services for individuals and then population level data. So uh, clearly we don't use census data to um, institute services for individuals. We don't use it to identify um, services for individuals. So notwithstanding the points that have been made, you know, we wouldn't use the census to identify people for screening or you know, other uh, purposes like that. We would use the existing health record data sets, so the CHI, the Community Health Index data sets, and the clinical records associated with those to identify individuals, for example, who are in need of particular services. Uh, but the census is clearly a key um, data source for resource allocation and, and planning at a population level. So I think it's just important to recognise the difference between those two data sets. So I suppose in Scotland, you know, we do have some uh, r very rural areas where small differentiations in the census or, or any data would be significant in terms of resource allocation in a rural area with a small population. 
Um, yes, so you, you use the census for a whole variety of purposes, um, including you know, the, the denominator data that calculates um, the index of multiple deprivation and other sort of indices like that, right down to very small geographical areas like data zones. So all of the, all of the data that we collect in the census is used through other purposes to um, make these kind of more um, precise resource allocation decisions uh, for local areas. Thank you. Uh, Professor McVeigh, your is criminology is your area. Uh, will it have an impact on that area? Um, well, I'm not really here to speak on uh, on the basis of criminology per se. Um, I'm really here as the co-director of the Administrative Data Research Centre in Scotland. So Scotland is really at the forefront of data linkage, uh, and census sits at the core of data linkage. So we have what we call a census spine, um, which is so the census forms the kind of core of how we link all other administrative data sets together. So it's vitally important that the census is accurate in terms of its measurement of the characteristics of the population in order for us to have a kind of strong spine to which to attach other data sets. Um, in research terms, um, the, the having, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental uh, property of research that if you're designing a questionnaire, you need to be very clear about what you're measuring. Um, I might say, possibly controversially, that I think the General Registrars of Scotland got it wrong in 2011 when they redesigned the census at that point and they conflated sex and gender identity into one question. And I think we're now trying to kind of disentangle that. So arguably, the measure that we have of sex in 2011 census is, is not accurate. Um, the, well, I think one of the issues that you probably realised from your various papers and discussions is that the issue of sex and gender is not a simple one. It's actually very complex and there are lots of different dimensions to it. And in some respects, trying to boil it down to two questions in a census is somewhat problematic. And I think that's probably why we're all around the table today trying to kind of disentangle the, the different aspects of it. From a research point of view, we know that there are certain uh, conditions, medical conditions, for example, that are sex related. Regardless of what your gender identity is, if you were born a man or born a woman, there are certain medical conditions that you will be more likely to face. We also know, and, and this is probably more my area, that there are certain kind of social processes that are differentiated for men and women. There are sex-related biases, discriminations, and forms of inequality that don't necessarily go away if you change your gender identity. So it's very important to distinguish between sex on the one hand and gender identity on the other in order for us to be able to understand, for example, do trans women have worse outcomes than cis women? And do trans women have worse outcomes than, uh, than cis men? Um, and you know, if we were to properly understand the relationship between sex and gender identity and how that impacts on other factors such as health, such as um, likelihood of getting a job, such as um, attainment within education, we need to be able to disentangle those things and have a much clearer picture. Okay. And you, you refer back to 2011 when you say that the NRS um, got it wrong when they conflated sex and gender identity. Um, that it's been put to us that there were notes that explained that, but we've actually asked for a copy of the census form, and the notes are not the guidance notes are not in the census form. They were somewhere online. Um, do you think it was uh, people understood the, uh, that that had happened? Some, some people will have gone to the trouble of reading the notes and understood, and other people won't. Um, the, prob the problem is that you will have some people uh, interpreting that question as their biological sex, and you will have other people interpreting the question as their gender identity. So therefore, you have a question that you don't really know what you're measuring for any particular individual. In addition to that uh, more general conflation, there is a proposal to uh, offer a third option in the sex question in 2021, so it would be male, female, other, uh, possibly the wording isn't decided, but there, that's, that's the suggestion, it's not set in stone, but it's a suggestion might happen. How would you feel about that? Well, I've spoken to members of the LGBTQI community and 
the word other is highly offensive, can I say, for a start. Many people from that community do not consider themselves to be an other. Um, and I think that fundamentally, we're still conflating two things if we use another category. Sex is about either biological or legal sex, whichever you decide to use, um, whereas gender identity has non-binary options. But, gen uh, but sex doesn't have non-binary options, even someone who's intersex, which is essentially a kind of medical um, uh, condition, even someone who's in intersex is generally an intersex male or an intersex female based on their their um, physical and uh, genetic composition. So w w you would still be conflating two things if you add an other category. I think, I think that the main thing is to consider what the different dimensions of gender identity are and to have a series of questions that allow people to adequately express um, how they feel about themselves um, and keep sex separate to that, be very clear about what we mean by sex, have, have guidance in the documentation that's very clear, and then have a public a publicity campaign around the census that explains why the questions are the way they are. We're not, we, you know, it's, it's not the purpose of the census to try and um, make people choose something that they, they don't want to, to, to choose to represent themselves. The purpose is to <coughs> measure the characteristics of the population and then to use that data to properly understand how, you know, how things like health conditions or social experiences, how education is, is delivered. Um, and in the era of measuring inequality, we know that many people from um, the LGBTQI community feel that they're discriminated against. We won't properly be able to understand how that manifests if we don't also understand what their sex is. Thank you very much. Claire Baker. Uh, good morning. Thank you, convener. Um, the, I wanted to ask some questions around the voluntary aspect of the sexual orientation and gender identity, as it's phrased at the moment, questions. Um, we had evidence from Equality Network and the Scottish Trans Alliance that said it shouldn't be assumed that adding these questions to the census would give an accurate count of the trans and LGBTI community. It might be the questions were seen as being too sensitive, that people uh, would be reluctant, some people would be reluctant to answer them. Um, so I suppose it raises the questions, if the questions are voluntary and the data is not going to be reliable, is it worth asking these questions at all? Or do you think there is helpful data and information that would come from asking the questions on a voluntary basis? We do have some evidence um, from the sex and gender topic report of how, what the take-up was of the voluntary question. And one thing that does come through there was take-up was quite high. I think from memory it was something like 94% of people when it was road tested um, had, had, put, had, in, had put something in. So I, I, the, the initial evidence is that people will respond, but others may wish to say a bit more because what, we, what that didn't tell you was what the response rate was among people who were trans-identified and clearly that's where it matters most. So. Perhaps I can come. Um, I mean, the evidence is um, over many waves, or three now waves of the National Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyle Survey, is that you can get very good response rates, um, even outside a census, for these kind of questions. Um, clearly, the question, it is likely that questions about gender and sexual orientation and trans identity are likely to change over time because they are quite quite shifting things with with social change. Um, but there is a very strong evidence base that you, you can get reasonable quality data um, on many of those aspects. That has been done in many settings with general population samples. So that would support um, acceptability. The, um, they are complex questions. Um, some people will have a better understanding um, than others. I think that there's also evidence that there will always also be reasonably high um, non-response rates, but I think there is no doubt from many, many studies of many kinds and population samples that you can get useful data that can inform policy. Um. Uh, yeah, so uh, just to highlight that um, the religion question in 2011 was voluntary, but we've made huge use of those data. So we've been able to explore the prevalence of different religions across Scotland and also um, use that to think about discrimination and, and other um, important uh, facets of, of society as a result of that. 
Um, there's also been examples where we've been able to link data in a very complicated way um, to avoid individual uh, identification, uh, to make better use of the ethnicity data within the, um, the census. And that's allowed us to explore differences in life expectancy, differences in hospital admissions for people reporting different ethnicities. And that's really moved on the, the evidence base around what we know. So, for example, um, the life expectancy of white Scots is much lower than... Um, many of the ethnic minorities within Scotland, but uh, hospital admissions for certain conditions is higher for some of the ethnic minorities. And these are things we wouldn't have known otherwise without these questions in the census. Now, I know the ethnicity question wasn't voluntary, uh, but we can make similar use of these data, even if they aren't completed entirely, because you'll still get um, a feel for what the differences are between groups. Um, the definitions that the bill uses, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to look at the actual bill. It's a very, sh a very short bill. And there's already been some... Um, responses from the panel this morning on the use of gender identity, which, as Lucy Hunter Blackburn says, is included in paragraph one of the bill. Um, there has been a suggestion that gender identity, when it comes to the voluntary questions, that could be changed to trans and be more specific about what the question uh, is in relation to. So I was wondering if you supported that. I think that would work better than what we have before us. It's really just changing gender identity to trans with changing the word in. And whether uh, Professor Susan McVie talked about the last census of 2011 and how robust the data around the sex question was, given the guidance <coughs> that was online and not always that obvious to people. Um, has there been any unintended consequences from the decision that was taken in 2011 or is it too, too early at this stage to make comparisons or can you see any uh, problems or issues it brought by not being clear about that question. But is it, it's quite a long question, it's the last thing, but, it, but is it in this context and society we're living at the moment, is it possible to put a question in this sex category that we can all be clear what, how people are going to answer? Um, <laughs> I'll try and remember all of those questions. Um, the, is it, can, we, can we make a question clear about sex? Yes, we can. We can either ask about biological sex or, or sex on your birth certificate, um, which is effectively legal sex, which means the sex that you were born, or if you've had a gender recognition certificate, then the sex that you have transitioned to. That would be very clear. Um, the, <laughs> I'm trying to kind of follow back the train of the for you, it's particularly having unintended, unintended consequences. From it's 2011. possible to tell because you can't disentangle the data if you've conflated two different things mm -hmm. together. So we would only potentially know that by getting the questions right in the 2021 census, um, because we may be able to look back at the. We can link censuses together, so we would be able to link back to the prior census and identify the proportion of those people who interpreted it as a, as their biological or legal sex and the proportion of people who um, identified as a, a trans man or woman and so put their gender um, preferred uh, identity in the, in the census. I mean, we, the, the, the honest answer is we don't, we don't know the numbers. And that's why the census is so important. The census is the only source of data that we have that's an entire population measure. Um, and so being able to measure the popula population accurately is really important. But more important is asking the, the questions that are clearly differentiated so that people understand what they're asking. I mean, I, you also asked about the, the questions that were proposed, I think. The use of gender identity, whether that's a definition to put on the face of a bill oh. that is clear <laughs> what the questions are going to concern. I think I, I'm not aware of that anyone's agreed on a definition of gender identity. Uh, the, so in the, the Equalities Act, um, the, the protected characteristic is gender reassignment. Um, and even, even that is a bit vague within the bill, to be perfectly honest. But the trans and gender identity are <coughs> wider contexts, concepts than just um, gender reassignment. So if you want to meet the Equalities Act, then you should be focusing a question on gender reassignment. Um, but if you want to um, respect the wishes of many um, LGBTI communities who want their, their self-identified <coughs> um, gender to be recognised in uh, the census, then you would need to ask 
a wider set of questions. But that, that's why I was saying it's very difficult. It's such a complex area. It's very difficult mm -hmm. to squash it down into one question about sex and another question about trans or gender identity or, or, or something else. Um, okay. yeah, the, the, there's, there's no, unfortunately, there's, I don't think there is yet a consensus on what is meant by gender identity. Um, there's possibly more of a consensus around what people identify with as trans, uh, but that's broader than gender reassignment. Mm -hmm. So it's a tricky terrain in definitional terms. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. You know, good morning. Um, going back to the issue of the, uh, the 2011 census guidance and the issue of self-identification, it has been suggested by some that in light of the fact that it almost certainly that the cohort of people here who may have followed that guidance and then answered the question, uh, the mandatory sex question accordingly, would be quite small, that therefore statistically it's not really going to make much difference to the uh, accuracy of the, the data. So that was a, an argument that has been put forward. It would be interesting to hear your comments on that argument. I think one of this, in 2011 versus 2021 is the big issue. So what happened in 2011, we, we can't tell, although Susan, Susan says if we got really good, clear questions in this census, we could go back and quantify in a better way. 2021 is a very unknown. I think I would be very reluctant to assert that numbers would be small in 2021, taking advantage of our ability to, to identify other than um, your, your birth certificate sex. We just don't know. And what we do know um, is that this is a growing phenomenon. That's why, of course, it, it's coming forward now, is that the numbers of people presenting in the most formal sense, so that's to gender reassignment uh, and, 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 and gender identity clinics, is going up really, really fast. But that's, that's only one part of the trans population. Not all of them will engage with those services. So it's a huge unknown, I think, is what you introduce into the data. Um, if you simply add extra category, you don't know how many people will use it and you, you can't do much if you simply do it in that on the kind of gender identity conflation basis you can't then do much to do all the things Susan mm -hmm. was describing so clearly about trying to disentangle all the characteristics of a person so you can really know about them so I think that's the issue with trying to say the numbers will be small in 2021 I, I don't think there's any basis for saying that and one of the other issues I work largely on data around higher education and education so it's not just about the aggregate numbers in the population that you need to think. You need to think about where it might be concentrated. So for the data I use, which is a lot about people in full-time education in their, sort of their teens and in their 20s, if the phenomenon of taking advantage of a gender identity flexibility in the question was particularly concentrated in that subgroup, the data effects would be obviously much more concentrated in that subgroup. So it's very unlikely it's going to affect people 50 plus that data is largely very likely to be, that, that would be, I would guess that would be a minimal effect, but as you go down the population, mm -hmm. it could change. And that, that's quite an important for me as a data mm -hmm. user, um, that the, the effects could be very unequal in subgroups and in ways that really mattered. So. Interesting, any other comments mm -hmm. on that? Yeah. Oh. Um, yes, I, I would agree with that. We, we think <coughs> there's small numbers, but until we actually have a measure in the census, we don't know how small or large that number is. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right. At a population, at a macro level, then it probably won't make an awful lot of difference. Um, but the purpose of the census is not just for macro level population analysis, it's for micro level analysis as well. That's why we collect such detailed information about individuals and about households. Um, and when it comes to things like looking at vulnerable and um, populations, marginalised populations, those often are very small. And if we don't have data, accurate data on those groups, then we're not able to tell how badly discriminated against they are. Um, if you look at health conditions, then if we want to look at things like, um, so trans women will still be likely, you know, they, they will have a risk of having prostate cancer, for example. You know, if we don't properly understand the relationship between sex and gender identity, we won't be able to, dis to, to analyse whether trans women and cis men are more or less likely to have those sorts of conditions. Breast cancer, so trans men um, I still have probably a higher risk of breast cancer um, compared to cis men because they are biologically women. So, you know, it's, it, if we don't collect that level of information, then we can't properly understand what risks 
certain groups within the population mm -hmm. face. Um, uh, th there is an, another point, I think, around, um, and it comes back to the question about sex and whether we should have this other category, um, and, and a concern that people will not answer the, the sex question. And again, I would come back to, you know, kind of a public campaign around why it's important to ask that question. But also, I don't think many people from the LGBTI community are aware that if they don't answer the sex question, they will be assigned a sex through imputation. Um, and if they're, if they're objection to um, self-defining as male or female is problematic, then I should think that their objection to being assigned a sex that they haven't decided on is probably greater. Mm. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, no, sorry. I, I thought you wanted to come in. Okay. Yes, I have. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just to make a couple of points. Um, so the census is clearly the most comprehensive data source we have for populations um, every 10 years. But I think committee members should be aware that it's not without its issues. So obviously we're moving away from the face-to-face -face collection of the data. Um, we're not sure what impact that will have on response rates and the accuracy of the responses. And we know that there's you know, budgetary pressures and other pressures to move the census further away from that and perhaps even to move towards a sampling approach, all of which will reduce the quality of the data. Even at present, so notwithstanding that census is the best source we have, um, there is still a response rate. So 100% of the population do not respond to the census. And so we already have statistical uncertainty around some aspects of it. And there have been some census years where there have been huge problems. So famously in 1991, um, around the time of the poll tax dispute, um, there was a very large non-response um, because people were fearful of um, being caught up in, the, um, in that dispute, if you like. And as a result, um, a large number of people had to be imputed, as uh, Susan's kind of indicated, into the data set in order to balance up what we thought was a missing population in 1991. So there are problems with the census as it is, um, but uh, so I, I think we should just steer clear from thinking that the census is accurate down to 0.001% on every parameter that we collect. And, and I would also like to uh, raise, if I may, uh, convener, um, a, a point that was being made uh, last week in evidence that we took, um, and just really to hear your comments on this. So uh, a point was made that um, whilst it was recognised by this particular individual that the sex question was massively important for things such as health planning, but they went on to say that sex is only a proxy for making decisions uh, about sex-specific services, uh, and then went on to give the example that not all females need cervical screening because they might have had a hysterectomy. Uh, we cannot tell whether someone will automatically need cervical screening just by knowing uh, that they are female. So this was the point being made to support the, the view that that person was taking last week. Um, it would be interesting to your views because, I mean, we've already heard from uh, Professor McVeigh, for example, that the, the, the use of the data goes much wider than simply for health purposes. But even if we just take health purposes and go back to the mandatory sex question, being, you know, potentially sex at birth uh, or, or sex uh, on the, the birth certificate to uh, deal with the legal uh, sex definition. Um, I, I would have thought, as a woman, that actually there would be many, many other potential health um, implications for ticking the box female, uh, whether or not you've had a hysterectomy uh, or not. Uh, you know, there'd be many other issues. Uh, am I wrong in that uh, thinking? Could I maybe answer that? So, uh, just to reiterate, for individual health care services, most of that will be run through the Community Health Index, the CHI data set, which is the, the um, collation of all your health records, whether it's your GP records, <coughs> your prescription records, your hospital admissions. And so that's the, the system that's used for the screening services, for identifying need. And, you know, in relation to the trans community, you know, the, the, the variety of healthcare needs within that very broad spectrum of a community will vary widely. And, and so the best way of identifying needs is not through the census. Uh, the best way of identifying those kinds of needs is through existing health records. Hard, I mean, if that is an example being given, I mean, you know, whether or not a woman has had a hysterectomy, I mean, you know, that's one element of their, you know, health uh, history. But there would be many other issues pertaining to your sex as a female beyond simply a hysterectomy and cervical screening, surely. So th th to me, that argument didn't really seem to, to be compelling to me, put it that way. 
and it was just really to, to right, it's back hear to from your, the data st st statisticians what, what you felt about well, it's back to whether we're thinking about individual need or population level need, and the two can't be conflated. So, uh, you know, as a woman, your needs will be variant on a whole variety of different characteristics. And you know, Beyond whether specific. simply you still require cervical screening or you've had a hysterectomy, there may be, well be other issues of preventing yes, You yes. mentioned breast cancer for being all, one. All, all true, but you wouldn't identify any of that. You wouldn't identify people's needs through the census for any of that. You would identify that through your health okay. record. And one last question for me, and I, I know that others will probably want to go back onto this territory, but I just was interested in, you know, the process of the census and, and at the moment, leaving to one side the face-to-face -face or, or whatever, but at the moment it's per household. Uh, and, you know, concerns have been raised about people's privacy and, and questions they may feel are, are intrusive, notwithstanding it's a confidential process, but they may feel are, are nonetheless intrusive. And I just wondered, you know, what were the reasons for the census being carried out on a household basis? And would there be any argument now, given that the questions are becoming a bit more personal, at least as far as people's perceptions are concerned, to have it carried out on an individual basis? The, the interesting things that is being explored is the capacity to give people an individual form. So in the coming census in 2021, um, people can apply for an individual form, so they don't have to have their data provide it as a household thing and that that's seen and this is part of actually the debate around this but probably other questions too and, and privacy and issues which I'm not a historian of the census but if you go back to 1901 or the, you know, you're talking about a world in which the, the, you know, the part of familias fills in the family form and we have moved on a great deal from there and, and you see that in the planning so I think one of the the things that Susan mentioned was what kind of publicity what kind of public information happens around the census in 2021 and this will be one of the things that will be very important to make clear to people who, for whatever reason, have any aspect of their data they do not wish to have reported for them. So that's, that's something which they, the NRS say that they are going to test further, how they're going to run that part of it. So I, I think it's important to notice how we're changing there. Okay, well, that's, that's good news. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's a really important point. It wasn't clear to me reading the briefing documents to what extent the piloting of various sensitive questions had been done with respect to how you would complete them in different circumstances. Certainly that has been a big issue in um, household surveys and that indeed is a large part of why the National Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyle Survey has, in, has sampled individuals within households to, precisely to avoid that. And, and it is certainly the case that there be many circumstances where it would be potentially particularly difficult to answer those questions and perhaps difficult not to be part of the household response, which I think is a really key point. Um, because by not being part of that, you disclose that you are not part of that. So I think that needs really careful consideration. It will probably affect a small minority of people, but that will be an important thing to get right. Okay. Sure. Should I just make a, a small point on that? So all of what's been said is true um, but one of the risks of moving towards an individual response is the response rate mm -hmm. and um, it's a balancing act so if you're trying to capture classically the, the teenagers or whoever who are not around when you're trying to collect um, the census data you could just fail to get them and that's a huge problem for voluntary surveys it's also a problem for census it's just that it's less of a problem because of the obligatory nature of it but the more barriers you put in place to collect the data, the, the poorer the quality of the data will be, and there'll be a balance about whether you get the best available data from one member of the household, or you collect individual level data on the full knowledge that you're not going to get as much of a response rate as you would otherwise yeah, get. Yeah, I can see that that would be a balancing act, but obviously people's uh, rights to privacy is a very fundamental, and uh, as Professor McVeigh has indicated in, in a general sense, that there can be a, 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 a wide-ranging information and take-up campaign, presumably, to uh, you know to have people uh, complete the census on an individual uh, basis. I, you know, one of the, part of the balancing act, I, I mean, cost is another balancing factor in here. Okay, thank you, computer. Thank you. Did you have a supplementary, Kenneth? I mean, just I, I'm not really uh, that much in agreement with Annabelle on this particular issue because I do think that, as Dr. McCartney said, there's a real issue about missing out large numbers of people, and I think we've been discussing on this committee uh, last week and this week, you know, about the sex question, but it's really irrelevant if you don't actually get a hold of the person in the first place. And I think the number one priority has to be an accurate population census, firstly. Mm -hmm. And other things are, 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 sec, are secondary to that. I don't know if the panel would think about that. 
I think it's important to note that they are still proposing that it would be a household form, so they're not moving mm -hmm. the census across to a wholly individual basis. My, my understanding is it would be a, a very interesting point probably to pursue with, with the government witnesses, um, mm -hmm. but my understanding is it's still basically the household survey, but you can request an individual form. So the question would be, mm. the one you're raising, is how far will that create the problems that Jerry is saying, that you, you might start having a lot of loss. But in order to come out of the household, you do have to request the individual form. So we're not sending out five million separate forms. Mm -hmm. So I presume that's the balancing act. And as, as Jerry said, this is all about balancing. That's the balancing act that the NRS is hoping will, will produce the right combination of, of coverage, yet some protection for those people who are really uncomfortable with having a household return. Yeah, yeah. people can request their own if they yeah, want. Yeah. Th that's my understanding. Yeah, Alexander Stewart. <coughs> Good morning, thank you. You've, you've talked about making sure we get this accurate information and the accurate data, uh, and that's vitally important because organisations, especially in the public sector, need to think about how they prevent and provide services to make sure this, this all happens. But do you think there is a, a good, meaningful understanding uh, of the terminology around uh, gender uh, identity that, that can capture that meaningful data in the first place? And then when that is already captured, how that can be used for public authorities to ensure that they manage their equalities uh, effectively, to ensure that they are providing the services that are required. I think it's something that, uh, I mean, there have been, not in census setting, but there have been many, many um, data collections of this kind. I think generally, um, obviously, they do the sort of piloting that Ipsos Mori will do. Some, um, I think for various age groups, for various cultural groups, um, there will need to be quite, potentially there might be quite, need to be quite a lot of explanation. Probably more than is needed for, if one were to want to justify biological or legal sex. Nevertheless, there are many um, studies that have prov provided good quality data and I think there's a great resource to build on in that respect. Anybody else have that? For me, it's just about having transparency and clarity in terms of the question. You know, if if the and and it's about looking at the users of the census and what information they need. So, do they need to know simply that someone self-identifies as trans, yes or no, or do they need to know more detail than that about whether someone self-identifies? As a, as a man, even though they're a cis woman, or where a cis woman, uh, or, or alternatively, there are all sorts of other um, gender identities such as gender neutral um, and gender fluid. Um, so ha how much granularity do the users need? And I think that's balanced up against how much personal information do the people from those communities really want to give in a census? Um, it's about what the benefits are. The benefits of the census are that it enables us to see what the broad characteristics of our population are. It allows us to plan and to target resources. It allows us to do fantastic research. Scotland really is at the forefront of some amazing research based on administrative data which is linked to our census. Um, but, um, but so identify what the benefits are and what level of information we need in order to, for users to use the, the information um, to benefit the population and go no further than that, I think would be my advice. May I add that, sir, I mean, the level of detail you're going to get and would want to get from the census is fairly limited, but there will also be things like the next sexual attitudes and lifestyle survey, which will allow you to make well-founded inferences about those populations and what the distributions are within them. So I think the census is part of the picture, not the whole of the picture. Identify that exactly the case that this is the, the one of the one of the factors that can be used to to understand and support individuals across the spectrum uh, about where they can uh, identify and how they then can fit into that process and how organisations uh, can then fit around them to ensure that they have that support mechanism and they have the confidence. Uh, in, in doing that to ensure that the information that you get is correct and then can provide that information for them going forward. So I think that by, by doing all of that, uh, it, it will help identify so many things. But there will always be individuals who are fearful of giving that information because 
it may be misconstrued or it may be uh, looked on in a different view. I mean, how, how do you think we're going to manage to try and get everybody to do that? Because without the complete accurate information, uh, then you're only having a snapshot. Not, but you're going to get very useful information. And, and one thing that was said when the first sexual attitudes and lifestyle survey came in is you won't get useful stuff at all. People will not make it, we will make it up. That is clearly not the case. You get good, useful information um, on things that there may be no final answer to in some cases. Okay. okay Thank you. One thing to that. Um, so in terms of thinking about small population groups and the utility of the data, one of the, the the, the really important uses is to look at different questions across the census. So, for example, knowing whether people with particular characteristics are more or less likely to be in particular occupations, for example. Now, one of the things we argued for strongly at the last census was having income data to understand whether there were differences in people's income. Now, that didn't get through to the final level. But, you know, these are the missing kind of things about looking at this sort of intersectional aspects of the population. And that's the kind of information you can only really get from a census where you have a very large sample size and be able to break it down by all of these different characteristics, whether they be protected characteristics or socioeconomic factors. Jamie Green. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. I just want to explore a couple of questions. Um, the, if you, I'm just looking at the current census, the 2011 census, and uh, question number two is, uh, what is your sex, male or female? Um, is it your understanding that people who are currently com who completed this census uh, completed it on their understanding of how they are currently living in terms of their current gender identity, or do you think there was a perception that this was a question around their legal status or their biological uh, sex? I, but as, as Susan said earlier, one of the problems is we can't at the moment tell how, how people read that question. What we do, the best evidence we have maybe is actually from the, the sex and gender topic report that accompanies the, this piece of work, which has some very interesting um, and quite rich data set of interviews with uh, trans people who'd filled in a, a pilot set of questions, so including a binary sex question and, trying, and, and comparing that with other questions. And what was interesting to me reading that was that within that group, there was a very mixed reaction to what the question meant. Um, and that was a question that was pretty much like the one on the, the 2011 census. So I think there is some indication from the topic report that at least some people who identify as trans will have read that question as a biological sex question. Um, but we can't tell. I mean, actually, I'm very taken with Susan's point that if we get a really good set of questions in this census that are very clear, we can backtrack and we can find out. But until we do that, it's, it's really very difficult to judge how that question will have been read. By those, for most of the population, it will have been a very straightforward ticking of the box. But for the group we're interested in here, it's unknowable, I think, what proportion read it in one way and what proportion read it in another. And, and perhaps before others uh, respond, if you want to, um, I might ask a further question. That's what, can I ask the panel, what sort of data should we be collecting? Because surely at the core of all this is, what is the purpose of the census? What, is, what sort of data do you need to be collecting? I mean, it, the, the, the previous census asked all sorts of weird and wonderful questions about how people travel to work or uh, whether they've been looking for a job. Um, you know, so, so really it's about working out how important sex data is or how important gender identity data is or sexuality data is. Do, does the panel have a view on what sort of data should be collecting, which therefore will define what sort of questions you need to be asking people? Okay, I'll have a go. <laughs> um, I mean, we, well, you, you start with the Equalities Act and you should be collecting data on sex. So whether you define that as biological sex or legal sex, that's essentially a, a matter for debate. It won't make that much difference to the numbers. Um, then you've got sexual orientation. Um, I think there are, uh, there are already a good um, set of well-tested questions around sexual orientation, so I don't think that that's particularly problematic. Um, then you've got gender reassignment, which is the protected characteristic. Um, now, I, I think the Equalities Act is not entirely clear what it means by that. 
to the actual description of gender reassignment and then some of the examples that it gives, if you look in detail at the content of the Act, is, is a bit blurry. Um, however, I mean, there are, there are a, 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 a number of surveys which have looked at issues around gender and gender identity, and I think we should be going to the tried and tested um, surveys that have identified good questions that have been have had cognitive testing to ensure that people understand what they mean and that they have relevance and validity to those individuals. So I'm, I'm not going to give you a set of questions, but I think that we're not starting from scratch here. Mm. I mean, I, I think um, Jackie probably knows more. Yes, I mean, I, I'd agree with all that, and I think specifically with regard to the trans question, I think it will be quite important to think what sort of dissonance um, from either biological or legal sex um, that might mean, um, because clearly there is a very strong sense, um, which I think is accepted in, in, the, in the plans, that there are people for whom that dissonance is problematic. Um, there's many, um, it's not at all clear to me who will answer that as yes, and I think it, it needs to be really thought about what, it, what is it that we need to know about what range of people who may or may not use the trans category beyond gender reassignment. And I think that's really difficult and it's not sorted, but it's really important. Um, if, if, if we want to have a population statistic for trans, then you ask a question about trans, yes or no. Um, I think you should possibly also give people the opportunity to see what they feel they're how they would self-define their gender identity. Now, some people will prefer not to say that, um, but many people... I think we wouldn't be sitting around this table if there wasn't a demand from the LGBTQI community to see that the census better reflects the characteristics of our population. Um, so I think it's giving people, you know, on a voluntary basis, the opportunity to self-identify in the, in the way that they wish, um, but not imposing... Um, a set of questions on anyone, and, and at, at, at any rate, that's not mandatory. I think the question about gender reassignment is a more tricky one because it is a protected characteristic. So therefore, we we should be collecting that possibly as a mandatory as a mandatory question. So I'm just waiting on the microphone. <laughs> that was going to be my follow up actually to that: is which, which of these questions uh, should be mandatory because it's important data for government to collect and which should be uh, voluntary. Um, and in that respect, uh, it sounds to me like there is still debate around whether the collection of both legal and biological sex would still would, would, have, would be useful also, because uh, as others have mentioned, um, uh, that would have, for, for example, some, some medical benefits of knowing uh, someone's biological uh, birth sex versus how they're currently defined in the law you know, for reasons of diagnosis of, of certain conditions, etc., as, as, was, as was discussed. So, you know, which, which, of the, which of these questions do you think we must know and which do you think people should be allowed to answer in their own way, regardless of what that question is? I don't think we need to define that question. And, I, and, and the, my final point is around whether the panel has any views on if the method of collection of this data is, will change next time around. Uh, i.e. people don't have to give face-to-face -face answers at the doorstep, uh, would you expect people to be perhaps more honest and open about their answers, or do you think there may even be some disproportionate levels of responses from certain communities <coughs> with regards to the census? Can I just say, I, th I think um, one of the reasons I would strongly support voluntary responses to these questions is it is clear that not all of these questions and, and as the guidance discusses are meaningful to all people so for example the history of collection of sexual orientation data in sexual health clinics um, many years ago we used to collect um, say somebody had gonorrhea or syphilis or whatever we would collect how acquired we did not at that point ask people what is your sexual orientation um, there are um, many people who would describe their sexual orientation as heterosexual but may well have same-sex contacts and so on. And so sexual orientation, it's a really useful construct, but it is not something that everybody would 
um, feel was meaningfully um, applicable to them in the same way. So, I th and I think that that may well be true for that's likely to be true for trans too. And where so where there's a problem with the um, well, not a problem, but where, where something is not universally felt to be a category that might usefully apply, then I think it's not clear that how you could or should make that um, a compulsory question, quite apart from all the wider issues about privacy. Just how you, uh, your question is more broad, but you're saying you're not suggesting that the sex question should be voluntary. I don't think that the sex question should be voluntary, and I think the que I mean the, the issue of what it is that one is wishing to have really robust data on through the sex question. So I think the quest sex question should be voluntary, but I can't see... The I sex question shouldn't be sh voluntary. Should not be voluntary, yes. but the um, sexual orientation and trans questions, I would say, should be voluntary for various reasons. The sex question, the you're talking about biological and biological and legal sex are slightly they're, they're, they're terms which are somewhat legal sex contested, I think, as to what is which. So the way I, I would like to characterise it is: we look at, are you looking at your original birth certificate sex or your current birth certificate sex? Because I don't think there's any dispute beyond the fact that it's one of those two which tends to come up as a legal definition of sex. You're looking at one thing or the other. And I think that's really the main issue that's, that's going to be, in terms of the sex question, is which of those two. And I'd, I'd like to refer back, Tim Hopkins made a point which I'd really like, I think the committee needs to give careful thought to, because it's an important point about privacy rights under the European Convention in Article 8, and how far that might bite on the census and the sex question on the census. And I think that that's, that's not something that the Scottish Government, that the, the policy memorandum talks about. But the, the issue about whether, and I think, with, I think my understanding is we're talking about GRC holders who have changed their birth certificate. I think there, there is a, a substantial point that's worth teasing out a bit more with the government about whether they think actual legal privacy rights at that level kick in for that small group of people. And I think I would, I would want to put on the record that as far as I can see as a data user, uh, the decision that made there is, is you, could, you could go either way and it wouldn't affect the data that the committee, that the decision to collect current birth certificate sex rather than original birth certificate sex affects such a small number of people. And we know a bit about them because we have a register so we know what age they are, we know, you know we, we, they're not an unknown group. Um, the, it, it, it's a decision that shouldn't, you don't need to worry about the data quality impact of which of those two you go for and I would be interested I think just to, to know that if that's a, a view shared. Yeah. Yeah. Odding there Professor yeah. McVeigh. Yes, yes yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean Personally, if it was a choice, I would go for legal sex, which means biological or whatever's on your birth certificate. Um, I, but I think there's, there, there's a wider group of people for whom their gender identity is, is more fluid or not necessarily, it's not confused, but it's, you know, it's, it's less clear. Um, and that's why it's difficult to have a set of questions that fit everybody. Um, because trans is used as a kind of umbrella term to describe a community, but there are many within that community that don't necessarily feel that they are the same as others within the same community, if you see what I mean. Some will have had surgery and others will not. Yes, or, yeah, or, or at various stages of, of medical treatment, uh, others decide that they don't want um, or they don't require to have any kind of medical intervention whatsoever. Um, so, I think Jamie Green, have you finished your line of... Well, yeah, just to start a final point around the, the way that we collect the data, yeah. if that changes and it's, it changes message to digital or postal or what have you, so um, will that affect the, 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 the data and perhaps some even question from Mr McCartney as well, in, in, in the sense that if you're asking these types of new questions, will that encourage certain communities to want to answer those questions and therefore the proportionate percentage of that data set would be <coughs> disproportionate to what you would normally get under a different collection method. I'm, I'm sorry if that's a convoluted way of explaining what I'm trying to say. Yeah, um, sorry, I'll, uh, just, uh, so there's two points here. One is, will changing the mode of delivery change the response to the survey? And at the same time, will asking a, a new question, which is quite a sensitive question, change people's likelihood to answer that question? And will that be influenced by the mode of delivery? So, um, so it's quite a complicated <laughs> set of circumstances because you're changing two things at once. So trying to test the effect of the change in mode of delivery on the response to the question is difficult because you haven't got anything to compare it to. What we can compare is... Um, 
I suppose, the level of response to those who complete the paper questionnaire in the traditional way to the level of response to the people who complete it using the, the electronic form. Um, we know, because we have tested um, in survey design, we have tested uh, asking sensitive questions using non-face-to-face methods, and it does tend to produce a greater rate of response. So in the Scottish Crime Survey, for example, back in the 2004, I think, um, we tested a telephone survey um, to collect the data on, on victimisation. Now, it was a terrible, it was a disaster, uh, because actually what happened is that people that hadn't been victims of crime just said, oh, it's not appropriate to me, so they put the phone down. But people that wanted to respond about crime um, uh, participated, and we had something like, if I remember correctly, a 150,000 um, percentage increase in responses to questions around sexual assault, for example, because people were much more likely to respond if they weren't being asked those questions directly face to face. So, the, and, and there are other examples where electronic means make people more likely to, to feel comfortable about responding. But the overall change in the mode of response, I think Jerry said very clearly that, um, you know, if you, it's a risk changing from um, face-to-face -face delivery uh, to electronic. You will have a percentage of the population that will always complete a survey. It doesn't matter how, what form it comes to you. You'll have a percentage that probably never will, and it's the ones in the middle. So it's, the question is, to what extent will we have to do more work to persuade the ones in the middle to participate? Want to come in? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for your uh, Scotland is not the only country that will have a census. Um, do you have any international comparisons in terms of the in terms of the type of question or question that should be or could be asked? And uh, I'd assume that this debate will be taking place in other countries as well. I'm sorry, I, I don't know enough about the um, the census in other countries to answer that question. The only thing I could add is just that I know that um, National Records of Scotland have been um, working quite closely with um, the other agencies across the UK just to um, work together in sharing costs around the investigation of different questions and sharing the costs of research. So I suspect that uh, questions across the censuses in the UK will be quite similar, um, both for comparative purposes but also just because the process has been quite similar. But I'm not sure beyond that. I mean, the only thing I can add is there are some very large-scale demographic and, and family surveys across the world, some of which do ask fairly um, detailed questions because there are because there's so few other data. But I think the census here, <coughs> excuse me, I need to see it within the context of very good health data, particularly in Scotland. Okay. <coughs> excuse me. I think I might excuse my. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. No, I'm fine. Thank you. Oh, that's okay. Right. Could I actually? Uh, sorry, Kenny Gibson. I want to tie. Thanks, uh, convener. Um, in a supplementary uh, submission to what she uh, gave in her robust evidence last week, Professor Rosa Friedman said, and I quote, the law clearly sets out. Um, that sex is biological and that transsexualism, what we now term transgender, is psychological. And this morning we received a paper from Professors uh, Bing and Bewley and Drs Clifford and McCartney, uh, another Dr McCartney from Glasgow, who, who said collectively that, and I quote, there is little supporting evidence for a genetic or anatomical brain basis for being born in the wrong body. This idea now is currency with the public and appears that they believe it is medically endorsed. Self-identification could lead to a neglect of the proper formal exploration of the wider reasons a person may want to transition. These are often unconscious and need time to emerge. And they go on to say that we believe usual standards of evidence uh, should apply based on the National Institute of Excellence in Health and Social Care so that interventions improve mortality or quality of life. So I'm just wondering if you can comment um, on these um, submissions, these views, how you feel about them. In terms of their relevance to the bill? The reason why they're relevant to the bill is because what they are saying actually in their evidence is that if we don't actually get proper, accurate information about the individuals concerned, uh, uh, then we may actually take the wrong decisions in terms of interventions. Now, I know that earlier on, uh, um, uh, uh, Lucy Hunter Blackburn, you said, that, uh, and, and Professor Jackie Cassell, 
agreed that um, the numbers are, are small, so therefore you don't believe they would really have any impact on how we actually look at, at, at interventions. But you also said that the numbers of people who are reporting to be, um, uh, you know, transgenders is increasing rapidly at, at the same time. So I'm just wondering if, in fact, uh, uh, there is a, a, a kind of, um, you, know, you know, there is something in what the, the two professors and two doctors are actually saying in this. I think so. In terms of the legal definition, I think Rosa Freeman was particularly <coughs> interested in the legal definition of sex, and that takes us back to the discussion of are you of looking at birth certificates, and if so, which ones? And I think that that's a very a kind of relatively narrow point, whereas I think the, the broader question about trans identity is we keep, I think, coming back to the, the same point, which is this is a very various group, and getting the right set of the right bank of questions, which has something about your unambiguous sex status, whether it's tested by one type of birth certificate or another, but then on top of that measures the other dimensions of how you identify yourself. Um, it's getting that whole bank of questions is what gives the sort of information that I think, if I hear that rightly, is, 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 is what's wanted and what's needed. Um, so it's about the, the layers of information we collect and, and not neglecting any one of those layers. Mm -hmm because we're dealing with a, with a very fast, and I think it's true, a very sort of fast moving, a shifting thing, that even by 2021, the language and what's acceptable in the terminology, we can't be sure we know um, how that's going to play out. So I, I, I think when you put that, that contribution together with, with Professor Friedman, so you're looking at just being very clear about the different types and separating the types of information you're you're collecting, and it comes back to the point that I think we've come back to a few times, which is, what are those supplementary questions? What, the, what clarity about the sex question, and then what is the nature of the supplementary questions which will do the best job for this particular community? Mm. Within, the of a Within the constraints of a consensus, which is not designed to give a comprehensive account of, of mm. people in detail. Yeah. Can I just um, reflect on, I think, one of the comments you've um, related to, is, uh, which is in relation to the evidence base around interventions and, and what have you. So I just want to reiterate that the census data will not be used to plan services for individual people. So the best source of that remains within the health service. So in a sense, this is a, you know, that's an irrelevant comment in yeah. relation to the census because yeah. you know, even if we get the, the questions perfect on trans status, on your biological sex on all of these different aspects that people have been discussing this morning that tells you very little about the needs of individuals within health services no i mean I, I, you said that earlier on actually and i think everyone's taking that on board i mean i certainly have i mean i'm just trying to give you the the the, the perspective that these individuals have basically the uh, you know in, in relation to what they feel is that overall medical services may not be designed appropriately if, for example, we're not asking the right kind of questions in this census, and I think they're looking for, um, uh, um, you know, questions that are more sex specific, if you like, rather than kind of more gender identification, because they think that even in that, well, we won't, you wouldn't be designing service on an individual basis, even on a collective basis, that um, we might not quite get it right. Well, I mean, clearly, the, the, the more clarity <coughs> we can get in the set of mm -hmm. questions, so that we're clear what. How, how we can interpret those data, the better. Mm -hmm. But um, that's only going to ever be part of the, 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 the battery of evidence that we've got available. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. I, mean, I, I would agree with Jerry. I think the, the more clarity we have, the better. But the census is not a survey. So, you know, there are limitations to what you can include in terms of people's background characteristics in the census. The census is intended to be a kind of broad... Def description of, of the characteristics of the population that we can then link to other data sets, such as the health data sets that, that Jerry talked about. Um, and se sex, is only, uh, sex is only one of a, a number of questions that are used to link those, those data sets, but having sex in the data is very, very important. Um, the other supplementary information we collect around gender identity, I think, is important for a broader range of of reasons, not just to look at um, 
patterns of health service. So you wouldn't use it to plan health services, but you would use it to identify, for example, whether people from the trans community take up services to the extent that people from the cis community do, or whether people are discriminated against within certain services, the, the criminal <coughs> justice system, for example. By linking lots of administrative data sets together, we can test all those things. I, I, I agree with what uh, the panel's saying. I'm only looking to see is, uh, would, would there, for example, be a possibility that uh, in terms of uh, uh, this, would there be a clustering, uh, uh, an opportunity to identify with other clusters? So, for example, it may be that people with certain characteristics are identified in some geographic locations, which might mean that in one area, say Edinburgh, there may be a requirement for specific services as a result of that. Uh, in other areas, there might not be. To an extent, that, that's true. So, um, it's easier to imagine it almost with age. So if you've got a, a more elderly population, you'll know that perhaps dementia services need to be more advanced in one area compared to another. And the same may be true for other characteristics. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Kavia. Can I come back in on this very important point that uh, Lucy Hunter-Blackburn raised about Tim Hopkins, Tim Hopkins' point about um, the privacy of people with a, a gender recognition certificate? and how um, it was something that was important for the Scottish Government to bear in mind. And Professor McVeigh, you, you suggested that that definition of legal sex, and I think wh whatever pe wherever the lawyers seem to be in this debate, there's an understanding that a GRC confers legal sex, and you said that you didn't think it would make a difference to the data, because I understand that only 5,000 people across the whole of the UK have a GRC, so it must be very small. So I understand your point about it not affecting the data. Um, however, um, there are moves to change the way. Uh, there, there's been you'll be aware that there are moves to change the way people obtain a GRC, and uh, it's been suggested that there may be in S S Scotland or the UK uh, a means of self-identification. So by the time that we have this census in 2021, it could well be that people can self-identify and get a GRC. And in the submission, the late submission from the clinicians, Bing, Bewley, Clifford and McCartney, that's already been referred to, they do say the number of individuals requesting medical assistance for gender uncertainty or dys dysphoria is, is rising and the de demographic trend is rapidly changing. So if by 2021 we had a situation where many more people could self-identify and obtain a GRC, and uh, would, would that affect the data? Well, I think, again, it comes down to being very clear about what it is that we want to measure. I mean, it will, it will affect the data certain, to a certain extent because we are, again, with using legal status, if, if, it do, if it is broadened out in that way, then we will still be conflating two things, biological sex and, and legal, legal sex status. Um, to the, from a research point of view, if people are registered and there are registers of who has been, um, who has gone through this process, then you can connect that data to the census so that you can, you, you can look at that as a, as a you can control for that when you're doing research. Um, the problem is when you have people that self-define and it's much broader and we don't have any um, measure of how many people um, are in that community. Yeah. I mean, that's right. As long as there is a, whatever the process is, if that process is understood, it can be, not perfectly, but it can be taken into account. Whereas if you don't know what the process is, um, which is like the case if, if a, if one simply adds in a trans question, which is fine, then one will not know what that represents. And therefore, you, you, therefore you, you won't, if you do know what the process is, it won't matter, actually, to an extent, because you will know what it is that you're measuring. Um, you might then make different choices next time round about what else you need, but that's... Well, you know what you're measuring, because how would, how would you know? You know, if somebody has a GRC and they just say that, they just tick the, the male or female box. How would you know that they were... Well, you would know at population level. I mean, this is the point about it's not used to deliver services at an individual level. So if you know how many people have gone through that process and their age characteristics and so on, and what that process consists you're not, of... But you're not asking them that in the census, though. No, no, you're not. But we do know um, we do know that there is this number of people who's gone through roughly this sort of process, and what and th th that get, allows you to deal with the data in slightly different ways. It's where you don't know how people came to 
have that characteristic that it becomes problematic in terms of interpretation of the data? I think it's, it's the difference between where we were in 2011, where we have no purchase at all on how people departed from biological sets. We've got nothing we can check it against unless we can work back from a later census to one where we say, well, we know there are X thousand people who've got a GRC. So we've got this many people saying that their birth certificate says at the moment they're male and this many saying female. We can, we can make a, a good quality estimation of the impact on the, on the total data of, of changes in birth certificates. It works at where it starts, I think where it gets more problematic is you, obviously what we do a lot with the census is we, we bring characteristics together. Uh, and it gets a bit more complicated as you start to look at, say, in my area where I'm interested in the relationship between education level, earnings, and sex, where we have a very clear um, thing to measure, which is about how that varies over time. Now, if there's a, a concentration of people um, taking, changing their birth certificate in, in a particular pop subpopulation, it starts to have, you have to start imputing quite hard, yes. is the word that, that Susan used, you have to start guessing backwards a bit by individual case. So that's not ideal, but it is better than pure self-identification, which has no, no reference point outside itself. So it is true, convener, that at the moment you can say with real confidence that the, the, the scale of GRC holding is so small that it, you wouldn't worry about trying to impute anything at the current level. If we turned around in 2021 and there'd been a legal change, and because the process, if they follow the process that was being put forward, it's a very quick one. So if it was brought into force in time for the 2021 census, it's feasible you could have, I don't know, thousands of people who, who are very keen to change their birth certificate, taking advantage of it before the census. So it's true that it could have an impact for 2021, but I would worry much less about that than, than I would about staying where we are in the 20, as was used in 2011, which is a much less manageable, much less estimatable effect. It's, it's about known unknowns and unknown unknowns. So, <laughs> so if people actually are, are registered somewhere, um, even <laughs> even they, though they use, if, if, we, if the definition, definition is legal sex, but they're registered somewhere, then that's a known unknown. So we don't know exactly in the census whether they are on the, the register or not, but we know that information from elsewhere. And actually through data linkage, we can, we can link those data sets together. So we could actually link the census data to the registered data if that data was made available for data linkage, which increasingly everything is. I mean, we now have vast majority of the health data, we have crime data, we have education data, we will shortly hopefully have DWP data. So increasingly we are cre constructing what we see in the Nordic countries as standard, which is all of the all the public sector data linked together so we have a much better mm -hmm. understanding of how everything links together. But the problem is when you have unknown unknowns, which mm -hmm. is the kind of the trans community is not defined in any kind of way, so we don't know who belongs to it. So if we have a kind of vague, ambiguous question in the census, and we don't know what the extent of the population is elsewhere, then we, we have no way of, of mm. uh, uh, estimating the, the scale of any problem yeah. of bias or discrimination or inequality, okay. for example. Well, well, you, seem to be, you seem to be as one on, on that particular point. Um, However, what says in the explanatory notes uh, for the bill is that the Scottish Government already conflates sex and gender. And it's very clear from some of the public authorities uh, who have, uh, we haven't had that many submissions from public authorities, but those that we have, um, I can think of at least one that clearly didn't understand the protected characteristics of the difference between sex and gender. And even the quality impact assessment for this bill conflates sex and gender reassignment. Uh, so clearly right across government and public authorities, there is a, a, a lack of clarity on this issue, which you are saying, you know, it's, a, it's an unknown and that, that's actually a problem in terms of the, the gathering of data. So um, I, yeah, I know that you're on the Board of Scottish Statistics, I, I believe. Um, are you concerned about this kind of creep um, in, in these attitudes in terms of uh, gathering statistics? Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, we, we know that we have many administrative data sets that don't necessarily use the same definitions for things, which is why it's so important to get it right in the census and why this could be a really important model for all of our other public sector data sets 
um, that we should harmonise on these questions. You know, it's, if, if they don't, and if these things are being conflated, then there are issues around the Equalities Act. Um, I, I think it's, it's essentially there's been a fudge um, over time, um, and it's, it's, this is the point at which to do something about it. And the, the NRS, through this work with the census, could really be kind of shining a light for all other organisations. Not, having said that, it is important to recognise that many administrative data sets that are used by public sector organisations, for example, are not collected as measures of the population. They are collected as management tools that enable them to do a good job. So it's not always as important that they have a clear distinction between sex and gender identity, because actually the purpose of them is to deliver a service to individuals. Um, and so, so for that purpose, it's not always um, as important. Um, however, I do think that people should be clear when they're talking about sex and gender identity, that they're two very different things. And I think, you know, as a society, we have not been good about defining those two things. I think people have had a problem of using the word sex to define biological sex because it's, you know, connected to, to forms of other forms of behaviour. So therefore, we've, we've, as a society, we've been lazy and tended to use the word gender when actually what we mean is sex. Yeah. You see that in the documents all the time, yes, that goes yes. from one to the other. Claire, did you want to come back? Uh, in? Yeah, just, just briefly. Um, I mean, this committee has given this bill a fair level of scrutiny, but do you feel that the um, NRS, in terms of consulting on this census and the previous census, where the guidance, which many panel members are suggesting was problematic, uh, was published? I mean, I was struck by Susan McVie saying that as a body, you weren't consulted on the 2011, um, and there seems to be a feeling that the 2011 question on sex that that went ahead without little or was there discussion? Where, where you as, as I wasn't part of a group that wasn't was or wasn't consulted. I mean, my point about 2011 was really just the design of the question. Um, but who did, they, who did they discuss the design of the question with? Do you think the consultation process that NRS have is, is broad enough? Mm -hmm. Um, to collect sufficient views before they make decisions on yeah, these areas. Well, me. we don't. Um, one of the things about 2011 is we just don't know what the, the process was behind the construction of the the guidance. It wasn't the question, of course. It was the guidance that went with it, and we just I, nothing has been said. I think, I, and I don't know what was done. It's a question to explore, perhaps, with them what the process was in 2011 that led them to this quite major change, really, in in, in conceptualising sex. It doesn't seem to have been subject to, well, certainly parliamentary scrutiny, but, but it's not clear what scrutiny it was subject to outside NRS. Um, in terms of the current process, I mean, the topic report's a fascinating read and has lots of great information about the, the sort of cognitive testing and the quantitative testing of questions, but it left me as a reader with quite a lot of questions about how the, the decision process staged by one decision had been taken and another hadn't. So there's a very strong statement at the start of the topic report on page three about the importance of um, sex as a marker and, and, the equality and, and the Equality Act and elsewhere. But then almost immediately it says, and we are going, and what we want to do is interpret sex as self-identification. And there's a jump from one to the other that really isn't explained in the document or in the policy memorandum either. And then as you go through the topic report, I had similar questions. So for example, if you felt very, very strongly that you must give people a chance not to not to provide their sex detail, that it was too distressing for some respondents to provide their birth certificate sex. Uh, why not offer a prefer not to say answer? Why move to a, an, a third sex option? And, and that, in fact, one of the trans respondents who is, who, whose comments are taken up says this, we, we could have a non-response issue. You know, so there's a whole, reading the process behind this, I was struggling a bit to understand why certain, at various forks in the road, why one fork had been taken and, and not another. Um, and particularly underlying that, though, is the why, why NRS seemed to be taking quite a strong view in principle that sex should be regarded as a self-identification issue and, and I don't find a clear explanation for that and how far that's explained by who they've spoken to and the processes is I think a thing you'd need to explore mm -hmm. directly with them. Okay, thank, thank you. Very briefly if I may. So I mean you know going forward then uh, if the NRS was to change its approach to working with a wider set of people would you be willing to to work with them to, to look at this? <laughs> <laughs> 
All of you, yes. as, as part of the, the user community, then yes, absolutely. Okay. We shall pass that on. <laughs> Do any other? Is everyone okay? Okay. Well, can I uh, thank our witnesses today for coming along to give evidence to us? It's been very helpful. And uh, I now move into private session. Thank you.